one of the fans uh, keeps asking if we can show the old intro, so I'm going to do it one of these times. Okay. But I also want to have audio of myself saying I'm going to do it so that I can paste it in at the beginning. Gotcha. And it'll look all sweet. With the strike of a light boat, I just air it out and leave with the mic broke. The micro, I'm hard body like Tycho. Heavy metal Chevys with nitro. Addicted to the papers of paper. Hypnotic to the thirst. I'm pulling off criminal capers. I know the cocaine crackery stinks, but that's what it is. Surrounded by the khakis and mints. We move. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Definitely Not Developer Commentary. My name is Mike Stout. I'm Tony Garcia. And uh, today we're back recording again. This is our second batch of recording. And uh, we decided to make a couple changes. For one thing, I played ahead a little bit. Uh, and for another thing, Tony's playing now for the first time, right, Tony? Yeah, I uh, caught up to where we were playing before. And uh, so now this should be taking off exactly where we left off. Uh, I tried playing up until this point on the higher difficulty, and I think we can talk about the difficulty a little bit later. Yeah, I had to go down, obviously. Uh, the one thing, I did bring this back, so now we're at the normal difficulty, just because uh, You're specifically way the me. arena. No, it's not even that, honestly. <laughs> I got here to the arena, uh, and I, it's doable, but it's definitely to the point where I died a couple times. And uh, it's probably not the best viewing experience to be stuck on sections. <laughs> uh, I found, and the normal difficulty, I didn't really get stuck in any sections. Uh, on the higher difficulty, I definitely had to repeat a couple sections one or two times. So just to make it for a smoother recording, we're going to keep on normal difficulty. But I do have a playthrough that I am going through on a higher difficulty. So people who do want to hear our opinions on the difficulty levels... We will be playing through on the higher difficulty, and we will have comments and thoughts. And maybe we can uh, mess around well. with it, since you can change it any time. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, on, on my playthrough, I, I had to take the difficulty down. <laughs> like, uh, a few levels from now, uh, it just got to the point where I was like, nope, nope. Yeah. So, spoiler alert, everybody, I suck. Uh, so, one of the things, uh, so just so we can get in here... Uh, one of the things that a lot of people talked about they wanted us to see was the uh, fidelity mode versus the performance mode. And I right. Think you, you played around with this, right? I, I was didn't... playing around with it a little bit, but if I'm being honest, I do not really have the eye that can tell too much of the difference in terms of 60 and 30. Oh, uh, right. I'm not yeah. that kind of person who really nitpicks it too much. Uh, but I know you have a much better eye for this sort of thing. <laughs> better is, is one way to call it. I, I call it a curse. Uh, uh, so I figured we could at least do one of the arena challenges that we've done before. Uh, one, once going through in fidelity mode, once going through in performance mode, and seeing if we notice there's any particular difference. Now, you guys might not be able to see uh, this because we're recording now at 30 hertz. Hopefully, this will fix the hitching problems we had with the first batch of recordings. But I will try to describe to you if I can see a difference. Uh, okay, so the fidelity, this is... This is on fidelity right now. So this is a 30 frames per second mode with nicer picture. Okay. Uh, right. We're going to go through. And we are on a 4K television this time, so we are looking at all in 4K now, and we're going to go from that point. So let's just uh, get started. So uh, let's go. Let's just do the welcome. Oh, wait. Uh, oh, I haven't done this challenge yet. So let's do the boomstick blast. I've been warned that some of these uh, bronze challenges are harder than some of the later challenges. So uh, while we're going through and we're calling out the frame rate, the one thing I noticed and the thing that made me sort of uh, realize that this is, probably, this is probably not the best thing to do on a higher difficulty was I did these arena challenges on the higher difficulty. And the biggest thing that I noticed really was that there's no health. Uh, in that whole first challenge with, like, Pierre and his, like, guys, uh, there was, like, no health that spawned. Oh, so it was just, like, you had to do it perfect. Like, it wasn't that it was so difficult, and I was able to get through it, but you had to, like, if you took a hit early, especially right now when you don't have a lot of health to play with, if you took a hit early, it kind of just, like, really sabotaged your whole run. Got it. So um, one of the things they're tuning is how much health you get out of health crates? Yeah. Well, no, how many health crates spawn in general? Oh, like, there was just I none see. that spawned 
in the uh, in the challenge. And that's probably an arena specific use of the difficulty tuning. Right. Yeah. And so it was just one of those things where it was just like, you know, I was able to get through it, but it was it really took a lot a bit of work to uh, to get it done, just because you had to play so perfect to do it. You had to not take the damage. And uh, it was just sort of not. Uh, I can imagine a particularly fun experience to watch, and especially when we're sitting here having to, you know, make comments and criticisms and all that kind of stuff. It's not the best experience. Well, I would like to see you struggle and fail. <laughs> uh, just, just speaking from my point of view, uh, but I, I understand if that might not be fun for you. Well, again, I enjoyed it. I actually liked doing it, but I don't know if I could, I could have done it while sitting here trying to talk <laughs> and like you know, see what was going on. That is always the trick, and I I admire uh, streamers and stuff who can like actually give interesting commentary while they're playing a game, because I can't. I right. can do one or the other. Uh, and uh, so far in this series, like people have been saying they liked it, uh, but we have not been giving one or the other. We've right. just been playing. Uh, so hopefully, now that I've played ahead a little bit. Uh, I can I can maybe talk a little bit more about what I'm seeing. But yeah, even like right now, going through this again on the normal difficulty, like these cr these health crates just keep coming back and they keep being here. And that, like there were like none, and I was just like, I didn't know if it was a bug or if it was whatever or if it was, but it was really hard. I'm and which which difficulty was that? On uh, that was just one difficulty higher than this. Oh okay. So it wasn't even like the highest difficulty. So I can't even imagine what it's at, at like the highest highest difficulties. Did you see at all on non-arena levels? Like, did it did it feel different to you? It felt no. I didn't have any problems. The I, the difficulty really only started to come up once I got into the arena. Before then, it was not really too much of an issue. It felt like when I went down a difficulty that it primarily affected the enemy's health and probably how much damage they were doing to me. Yeah, uh, which that's pretty par for the course in terms of ratchet difficulty. Uh, I'm guessing they're probably also doing uh, dynamic difficulty tuning in the background. Yeah, I'm certain of it. But I haven't seen any of it happening yet, which is great, because that's what you want with a good dynamic difficulty tuning system. Right. The, the players don't know it's there. On, uh, uh, so like, I think it was Tools of Destruction and Resistance. Uh, we had a system where, like, we would track how long it took you to get through segments of levels, and uh -huh. then we would have a target time for that segment. Right. And if you came in under that time, we would make the game a little harder. And if you came in over that time, we'd make the game a little easier. And then what the difficulty selection did was it kind of set, like, uh, what's the cap at the top of how hard we're going to make it? Right. And what's the cap at the bottom for how easy we're going to make it? And so if you were in a harder difficulty, the ceiling was higher, and so was the floor. Uh, right. And so I imagine they're probably doing something oh, similar. Oh, I died. Uh, with this is that... Oh, yeah, and the other thing is, is we would only tune the future. Right. So if you were in a segment, unless you were doing really bad, we would never make that segment easier or harder on you. Got it. But the next segment, based on how you did in this segment, we would take it down or push it back up. Okay, so we just went through that on fidelity mode. Uh -huh. And I think you got a baseline of sort of how it looks. Yeah. So, okay, so that let's was the go... 30 hertz mode. Yeah, that was, the, that was the 30 hertz mode. So now let's drop this over to performance. Okay. Or performance ray tracing. And let's just do performance ray tracing. Let's just get the ray tracing. Yeah, because I... Uh, uh... I might also might not be able to notice it on this level because they're not showing a lot. Uh -huh. Like we may need to go to a level that. Okay, has... we'll we'll see if we'll see if the frame rate difference at least makes a difference, and yeah. then if it uh oh requires okay well, let's reload. Uh... Oh wow, yeah, that is a big difference. <laughs> holy shit, you you don't see that? A little bit, but it I I don't have the holy shit reaction. Oh that no, you that do. that's a <laughs> that is a big difference to me. Uh, like it's just butter. Uh, I would, I would, uh, I would pick this. You would pick this mode. I would definitely pick this mode. Oh yeah, that looks better. It's uh, uh, 
So I used to not be able to see frame rate breaks. Uh, and then Ratchet 2 happened. And uh, it was my job. It was your job to notice the frame rate. Yeah, breaks. it was my job to find to a certain extent, but, but certainly fix frame rate breaks in the game. And, uh, uh, and I can't unsee that now. Like, it's a... Uh, I kind of am jealous that you can't tell the difference. I mean, again, it's not like there's no difference, but it's not to the point where I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I, this is like such a, it's, it's like night and day to me. It's not really night and day to me. Yeah, and, I, and it's correct, right? Like a, a, a solid 30 hertz, after a while, I'm not going to have a problem looking at it. Right? right. It was just seeing those two back to back for me is a, a noticeable difference. Uh, not just like in when you're moving the camera around, like how, how smooth it is, but also uh, just like looking at the scrolling water or I guess death lava or whatever effect uh, like that. That is smoother, too, right? Because it's something that's happening over time. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I would go with this if it were me, but that's just because I have the unfortunate training. Right. Where I have to see this stuff. Uh, yeah, you know, in um, in the PS2 games, we we had a system where if if the game broke, uh, if the frame rate broke under 60 hertz, uh, we would immediately switch the game into 30 hertz mode until it got uh, better. Until the the performance got better, then we'd switch it back to 60, and you'd see a small hitch, but it was way better than seeing. 45 frames a second mm -hmm. followed by 50, right? Like different different frame lengths on each uh, frame. And I thought it was way better than uh, like Jack's solution, for example. Lots of games did it, but I noticed it in, in Jack and Daxter, is that they, they, they turned off V-Sync so there would be tearing instead ah, of frame gotcha. rate breaks. And man, tearing to me that, I mean, is that's so not, much harder it, to look you at. Can't, you can't not see the tearing. Right. Yeah. You know, there is some people who don't see the frame rate drops, but the tearing is it, you you can't really mask that. Like it's just you're gonna see it. So in case anybody uh, isn't familiar with with tearing, uh, so what happened on uh, old CRT uh, monitors and televisions is you have a you have a gun a light gun that's basically drawing from the upper left all the way to the upper right, then it goes down one pixel and goes all the way from the left to the right and just repeats that until it gets to the bottom of the screen. And uh, generally what you wanted to do was update the screen while the gun was moving from the lower part of the screen all the way back up to the upper left. Because then uh, when it drew that frame on your screen, it would all look like one thing. Whereas if you, if you didn't have it, uh, if you had it so it could update the frame whenever, you might have part of the previous frame drawn on the first quarter of the screen, and then the new frame is drawn on the lower part. So it looked like this big tear effect mm. going across the screen up and down. And it, it was not, in my opinion, like, <laughs> I did not like seeing it. Uh, okay. So I think I think it was funny that you went from Oh, I don't know if we'll notice a difference here. To oh my god, oh my god, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, is when we were looking at it at thirty, I didn't see anything wrong with it. I, so I but now that you to, see this, yeah, you're like, this is what I want. I, I'm getting used to it now. It's, I think, uh, I. So a couple of things that I saw because I know they introduced a similar sort of vibe for this, and I think that's just, uh, let's just sort of move on, and we can talk while we move. Cool. Um, I noticed they introduced a similar sort of system for the Spider-Man game. Uh, in the PS5 Spider-Man, they have performance mode. They have, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, what I thought was very interesting when looking at the comments on Spider-Man is because Spider-Man moves so much, um, I actually heard some people say that they can't play Spider-Man at 60 FPS because it gets the motion sickness because it's moving oh, so... Like, yeah. the fact that it slows down a little bit actually makes Spider-Man a little bit more playable for some people. Um, but because he's like flying around the scene, um, it can be it can be difficult to play Spider-Man at, at 60 frames per second for some people. Yeah, uh, which is interesting to me. But yeah. And then I know that some games, especially like uh, in Unreal, there's a, an option you can set so that if it 
if the frame rate goes down, they start blurring the frames together a little bit so that it you don't get that harsh frame rate break. Yeah. But I know that that makes some people sick too. So there's, uh, you know, people have options to turn it off now. It's just there's sort of a price to using any of these tricks. Yeah, absolutely. If you can't get it all the way to the max uh, frame rate. I'm just going to do a little bit of upgrading here because uh, I wasn't – this save, I haven't sure what I've done. Uh, I do – so I am with you 100% that the Negatron Collider is uh, fucking awesome. It's a really good weapon. It's a great gun. Uh, the Ricochet, I've been having problems figuring out how to use the Ricochet. Me too. It's not my yeah. favorite, but I kind of... It's a good, like, not have to aim weapon. Like, once you get that first shot, it does auto-tracking, which is kind of nice. Uh -huh. But I haven't really figured out its... Uh, it's niche yet. Uh, and I think we're just going to, let's just move on from here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know there's a rare, there's some rare titanium and stuff on those later missions, but yeah, we're just going to, we're just going to move on. Uh, and we've done the side quest stuff on other playthroughs. So that's not what we're going to do here. We're just going to keep moving on with the story. Yeah. If we need to, we can always come back and farm. Uh, so you want to stay on performance mode or do you want to go into fidelity mode or do you want to maybe just switch back a little bit uh, as we record through and see where we... Uh, yeah, why don't you switch in? back and then we'll see if my eyes... How, how long my eyes bleed for before I get used it, to it. It's going to be interesting now going back having seen like the smooth as silk. Uh, yeah. What's the, what does it say? The diff I mean, is the difference they turn off ray tracing? Oh, so there's performance, which has no ray tracing, and then they have performance ray tracing with, with ray tracing. So do you know much about ray tracing? I don't know a ton. Uh, I mean, I've done some ray tracing in the past. It's basically just a really, really uh, fancy way to do, like, reflections and things like that. Okay. Um, and for the longest time... Uh, so basically, it's, like, it's a way to do very realistic reflections by shooting out rays, like, from pixels, basically. Oh, like well, it's called ray tracing. Well, no, no, like, like vector rays. Okay. And, like, actually calculating, like, the bounce for each, like, location. Oh, wow. Um, and just for the longest time, everybody knew that if you wanted to do really good reflections, ray tracing was the way to do it. But for the longest time, it was just too expensive to do on... It, I kind of I kinda see it, the, the performance, by the way. I kind of... Oh, yeah. I do kind of see it. I totally see Especially it. Especially when you spin the camera. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's always where it gets you. Yeah, uh, yeah, because any any prolonged smooth action is going to kind of get it. But like, even when you're running up this, like if you run up and down this thing, you can kind of see the, uh, like the texture starts shaking a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if this, if any of this will come through in the video or not. But uh, it's just yeah, anything that needs to look like a straight line while moving. Is it aliasing? No, it's not aliasing, right? No, it's right? not aliasing. It's, so, yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I've been away for, uh, you know how long. So, I thought we should catch up. What have I been up to? Oh, just speaking with my <laughs> adoring fans. I love these little bits of art. Enjoying yeah. my lovely scenery. continue to be and finding amazing. out that there are two, two insolent lumbaxes running around to That's gotta be his worst everything. nightmare, too. So, <laughs> I'm offering a bounty of three squillion nefarious freedom coupons to anyone who can. I am very eager to see the the competent nefarious show up. Yeah. And uh, and have to deal with incompetent nefarious, <laughs> which I'm sure is going to be a good dynamic. He'll probably uh, sabotage himself because that's yeah. what Doctor Nefarious does. I was going to say, uh, I love how the Lombaxes have become n well known for being one person armies. Yeah. Right? Like, uh, and that's like when we first created Ratchet, I don't think any of us had an idea that, oh, Ratchet comes from a species that is known for being armies unto themselves. Uh huh. Except that we've now made so many games where Ratchet's an army unto himself that it's like, oh, well, of course, the right. Lombaxes are this way. 
Uh, so, which level do you recommend, Mike? Having played through, which one is the? Uh... Uh, let's do uh, let's do Blizzar first. Blizzar, I, okay. I liked that one. Is this one the Rivet mission? Yes. Okay, I'm on board with doing the Rivet mission. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't want to harp on the performance mode stuff too much. But I do think it's very interesting because I just want to go back to one comment. Uh, our friend uh, Ryan Juckett, who's probably the smartest person. Uh, I know. He might be the smartest person I've ever met. Yeah. yeah. He's real smart. Uh, if you hear clicking and clacking, that's my dog uh, walking across the floor. Um, but yeah, well, hopefully that, that's not going to be too much of an issue. But uh, he has a big problem with these performance and fidelity modes just because he, the point that he made, which I thought was very good, is that when you play console games, they're great because they're a curated experience. You know you put it in the disc, you know you play, you know you're playing the best version of the game that's there. You don't have to deal with all these settings like you do on PC and all that kind of stuff. When you have all these performance modes on here, you're, you can be left in a situation where the player is questioning, am I playing this game the way the developers intended me to play it? Mm -hmm. And having that question in there where the player doesn't know if they're actually seeing the best version of the game is a negative to him. And I can see where he's coming from, like to make the player be like, is this the better one? Is this a better one? Even though it comes down to personal choice, right? it's still a choice that you didn't have to make on consoles before that's there now, which can be a bit of an issue. I can see that, yeah. Uh, I uh, uh, would hope that, uh, you know, the, the people making games are always testing it in all the different modes, right? To make sure that they're all good experiences. But they're not all going to be the best experience, which was kind of like when we were making it on the PS2 just for one, you know, just for one machine, we, like, we only had one mode because that was, that was the best we could do. Right. Uh, we weren't expecting people to have all kinds of different televisions, at least not at first. Like, remember, uh, by the time we got to Ratchet 3, I think, we were supporting progressive scan TVs, which was like another yeah. uh, uh, thing you had to turn on or off. Uh, so we were doing it even a little bit back then, but I can, I can definitely see where he's coming from on that. I like the low gravity. Uh, I don't know why uh, I don't get low gravity now. <laughs> Uh, but I, that was a that was an interesting first jump. Oh yeah, so you're um, uh, you probably didn't hear because the volume's low. But what happened is, you guys showed up on this planet and everything was dead. Right, and then I swapped, swapped dimensions with the with the crystal. Yeah, I do so have the have, I do have the audio coming. So through. now you have gravity again. Yeah, yeah. I I, I really liked this uh, mechanic, the crystal swapping universes. I always like that. Uh, like we had we had one in. Uh, Skylanders, uh -huh. where uh, in one universe it was like uh, movie flats. Glove of so Doom like, is coming. Oh I'm yeah! I'm very excited about yeah. this. I was very excited to see the the Glove of Doom. I kind of I sh kind of sad that I wasted all my bolts on the uh, on the drill on the drill gun. If the if I knew the Glove of Doom was coming, the drill gun's good. Uh, but yeah, I agree. The Glove of Doom is is definitely uh, the the main event. Let's call it. Um, but yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. Do you uh, remember what I was saying? I do not remember uh, at all what you were saying. Neither do I. Uh, I'm sure it was something incredibly insightful. Oh yeah, uh, in Skylanders we had this this one where in one universe everything was like movie flats, so a house would just be like a, a you know thin plywood cutout, and all of the people were like creepy puppets that were just standing. Oh, that's there. really cool. And then in the other universe the houses would extend out to be like real houses and the puppets would move around and talk and stuff. Uh, so it was like one universe, which is creepy, and the other universe, which was really creepy. And uh, yeah, we did a bunch of those in Skylanders. I always liked them. You think there are a lot of uh, Ratchet and Skylander crossover fans? Uh, no. I mean, the, the mascot platformer community... Uh, seems to be very passionate, uh, which I'm sure you managed to experience a bit having gone through Spyro and Crash. Right. Uh, I, 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 you've seen pretty much all flavors of the mascot uh, platformer community at this point. Yeah, I, there are very few giant 
platformer uh, franchise I haven't worked on at this point. Uh, I haven't worked on Sly or Jack, I suppose. Uh, or Donkey Kong. Or, okay, never mind. There's a lot of platformer franchises I haven't worked on. But, be, you know, between Ratchet and Skylanders and... Uh, I mean, to be fair, Crash, they're not making uh, Sly or Jack anymore uh, at the moment. That we know of. That we know that of. That we know of. That I know of. Yes. Okay, so I don't. I, I just want to point out. First, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anything. You're gonna get so many tweets about people like saying Mike's out hinting at Jack and Daxter. Or, I have. I guess. I have no. Be? I have no information. I'm. I'm being serious. Uh, like, and even it. Like, there are people at Insomniac I could ask. I have not asked, and I don't know anything. But wouldn't it be sweet if now that Insomniac is owned by Sony? that they sort of got, like, all the platforming franchises. That would be interesting. Because Insomniac knows how to make a great platformer. It would be kind of fun to see what they yeah. could do with Jack. I mean, and, and Jack was ripping us off the whole time. Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm going to get so much hate. Oh, man. It's, it's not, that one's not, that one's not going to play well for me, I don't think. <laughs> that, I, I mean, it's, it's a joke, though, right? It is it's a just, joke. It's just uh, we long time fans of the channel will know where I'm coming from. <laughs> so the uh, I guess I'll just explain the joke so it's not funny anymore. Uh, the so when when our games would come out staggered slightly apart from each other, anytime we had thought of doing the same feature, even though we we weren't talking with each other, we would sometimes think like, oh, arena battles, right? And then uh, we'd play the other game and we'd be like, oh, they ripped us off again. But I'm pretty sure they had. Plenty of opportunity yeah. to say the same thing. Uh, did you ever play the third Sly Cooper game? The one where they had the I did game? not. I played the first Sly Cooper, and I didn't play any of the ones after. Because uh, I'm, uh, weirdly enough, I'm not a huge fan of mascot platformers. I kind of, what? after Donkey Kong 64, I kind of gave up on the genre. Oh, and wow. That, never really that game ruined the it. genre for It me? ruined the genre for me. Holy crap. Uh, I, I couldn't even finish um, Super Mario Odyssey, which I hear was fantastic. It was great, yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I played, uh, I played maybe 10 hours or so, but I put it down, and I just never picked it back up. Um, so even, even the game games that are masterpieces <laughs> are difficult for me to DK64 uh, to was not... DK64 so was not a masterpiece. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk shit on somebody else's game, but it, I. I think not a masterpiece is. I think it manages to stay within. I was gonna say. Yeah. I think we can both agree that it wasn't a masterpiece. Yeah. Uh, uh, the you know for me the thing was there were just too many, too many collectibles. There were so many collectibles. Without enough things to do that were different you know what i mean like when i if if i want to collect a collectible i kind of want that to be tied to a variety activity like in, yeah like assassin's creed probably has as many collectibles as donkey kong did but they're all divided among different activities like yeah. here's the ones you get for climbing up real high here's the ones you get for finding new areas here's the one you know for going into hidden uh, uh places we wouldn't expect you to go uh, I just never got that feeling with that game. Oh, that I love that explosion. It's such a good explosion. Their effects, their effects are just so good, like yeah. world class effects yeah. here. Uh, and this is not just for this game. I'm mean, across the board since they've been doing like the PS3, PS4 yeah. games. Uh, the, I mean, on Ratchet of, specifically, and that's not to, not not even to talk about like like Sunset Overdrive or anything that's saying that those aren't great, but I love the art style of this kind of thing with the big cartoony effects. Yeah, always just makes me smile. Yeah, the I I feel like the because uh, when we were making these, like you were making the effects, right? Like, right. Yeah. Uh, and I am no artist. The programmers basically would code the effects, hard code the effects in. And uh, and now they have tools so that artists can make really nice effects uh, without without needing to have them hard coded. And that makes such a difference. Like I think uh, Ratchet wise, uh, Tools of Destruction was the first one where we had 
uh, tools that the, the artist could use to make particles with. And it's like nothing on you, Tony. Like your effects were great, but like artists, an artist effect are way better. They're not even particularly comparable. Yeah. Like it's, <laughs> it's insulting to the artist to even compare the two. I mean, programmer art is a euphemism for a reason, right? right. Like sometimes it's great. You get sometimes get programmers who are artists, but a lot of the time, your artists are not programmers, and your programmers are not artists. And yeah, uh, I I do know a few tech artists who could probably give us a run for the money when it comes to programming. Perhaps someone here can direct us to the drill, the chief engineer survey station. Man, look at that! Such a good, such a good shot. For example, the average miner spends. I really like the concept of this level as like two levels um, not just because you know I like that switching between worlds thing because the entire point of this game right is that the the universes are being ripped apart and so not only is it like a cool feature that I've seen in other games it's like specifically dramatically appropriate for this game mm -hmm. and also to show off the fast loading uh, which we haven't talked a ton about, but I think part of the reason that this game can look as good as it does is because they can, like, loading is no problem. Right. right. Like, you know, uh, you can you can switch the world, and just having that little uh, fade-out effect is enough to load in a whole new set of things. Right. Whereas before, you would have had to store both versions of it in memory and then disappear one and, and bring in the other. And that was always more difficult than it sounds like it should be. Uh, whereas in here, like, loading is gameplay. Gameplay is loading. So, uh, you know, like if, let's say you go around a corner and you can't see backwards anymore, you can load in a whole bunch of textures, right? And outload a whole bunch of textures just because there was a switchback or a... Uh, uh, you know, some sort of occluder. Uh, and that means that everything can be way less limited, right? Like, you don't have to say, uh, decide whether you're going to have, you know, like metal or wood or organic or industrial. Like, you can you can do different I mean, things at different just look at this levels. part right here. All these characters, just like, boom, whole new environment. Exactly. Just like, just like that. And then environment... And characters, it's fucking crazy. Yeah, it's fucking yeah. crazy. Yeah, like we, because all of these characters would have still been in memory. Right. Like a lot of them are are similar looking, right? So we could have done optimizations to to make this happen, but uh, but when you switch to the other world, all of this world would still have been in memory, unless we did like a several second long chunk load. Uh, so it it would have been a very different. Like, we would have had to use more between this dimension and the other dimension. Mm -hmm. Whereas this dimension has a lot of metal that's clean and shiny because that's the whole point. This is pre-ruined. The other dimension has metal that's rusty and destroyed and, like, uh, and lots more rock, you know? Like, and it's a completely different color palette. Like, there's a whole lot of those things that are only possible because of the fast loading. And when I heard that they... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, when I heard that they were doing this, that they had finally put the effort into a machine to do this kind of insane fast loading that the PlayStation can do, uh, I was like, okay, that's it. That's over. <laughs> like, Because um, I was just thinking about all the times that games have succeeded and been killer apps specifically because they did loading better than other games. Like uh, Ratchet and Jack, right? Uh, we were able to uh, like stream and load and occlude and do all of these tricks to get things in and out so that we could do more than what you could do without those tricks. On the PlayStation, uh, I, I, I saw an interview that like... Um, so Andy Gavin, the, the, the programmer at Naughty Dog when they made the original Crash games, he, uh, they used to ship the operating system on the discs, not on the machine, because there wasn't any internal storage on the PlayStation 1. And so what he figured out how to do was uh, 
uh, in the in the in the PlayStation operating system, whenever the laser was moving to a new spot on the disc, you couldn't do anything. Like you couldn't run other code, and it was you know a millisecond or something. But that's a big deal. Uh, and so he figured he rewrote the operating system on those discs so that he could do things while the while the laser was moving to a new point on the disc. He could unpack a few more textures. He could do all these things. And that made it so that he could make the original Crash Bandicoot games look like something that was impossible on the PlayStation. Mm -hmm. like nobody else was doing that kind of thing because he made loading a little easier, right? right? And, uh, and, you know, it, it was always that way. It's came, like, how can we trade off having things in memory for having, like, uh, uh, things run fast or things run different. And you just don't have to make that decision now. Mm -hmm. you Because you can just load it in. Uh, and I'm I like, so that's one of the things I've been blown away by while I've been watching both while we were playing and then while I was editing the episodes. Like how much of a difference this is actually making mm -hmm. and how not obvious it is that it's making that. Like it's all, it's doing it so smoothly and undetectably I don't know uh, it, it sort of blew my mind that it took this long for someone to think what if we made it fast to load right and cartridge based games always had that advantage right where you could load stuff really fast but since the advent of disc games we sort of lost that ability and now we're, we're getting it back to a certain extent yeah So not to change subjects too much, but there was one thing, and I'm trying, I, I apologize right now uh, for the way that I'm playing, but there is one of the features here that it's making me play in a way that I don't enjoy, and it's very hard for me to fight it. Oh, yeah? So we noticed in before on the map that every time you click on the map, it like shows you all the stuff. Yeah. It shows you all the crystals, it shows you all the raritanium, it shows you like all the, it even shows like the golden bolts on the right. map. Right, yeah. What I find myself doing when I play is just constantly opening the map and being like, is there Raritanium nearby? Mm, is there I, Golden yeah. Bolt nearby? And you don't enjoy... Uh... I don't enjoy constantly... Hit, like, I want to just play through. And I find myself just constantly, like, stopping myself and being like, is there anything nearby? No. Is there anything nearby? No. I don't particularly enjoy constantly having yeah. to stop and check. But I feel obligated to because if I don't check now, I'm just going to have to backtrack through later you're gonna miss it right oh interesting um so i apologize for people who are very who are not liking that i'm opening and closing them. i'm trying to not do it <laughs> but it's very difficult for me to not just constantly be checking the map and being like oh is there anything like right by here that i need to pick up before i move on to the next section i haven't been playing paying super close attention to how well or poorly you're playing but i imagine it's a lot better than when i was playing uh <laughs> Because, uh, uh, and, and you know, you're on the higher difficulty even. Uh, but, like, yeah, I, I certainly got my sh fair share of people uh, being like, Mike, have you ever played these before? <laughs> and the answer is, yeah, I just am not that great at it. I, there was one comment that I saw, and again, I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not calling it out to shame you or anything. I just thought it was very funny uh, that one of the comments I saw was, like, it's a shame that there's a video game developer who's so bad at games. <laughs> like, uh, I'm the only one. <laughs> and I was just like, you have no idea what you're talking about, man. Like, 90% of video game developers are fucking terrible, not just at games in general, but at their game in particular. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is not an anomaly. Like, this is just the way that it is, man. You can love the game. You can work, you can, uh, work on the game. You can do it every day. You can be excellent at your job. But just be terrible at the actual playing part of it. That's just yeah. that's just the way that it goes, man. Yeah, it's uh, uh, the I, I don't even know how to explain it, except that I I don't like playing super hard games most of the time. So I usually play games on easy, and. Uh, uh, and that's just like what I like, right? Uh -huh. uh, but I know for a fact that there are a lot of people like me making games. And if we were limited to only making games for a difficulty that we could handle, 
right? That would limit us greatly in our ability to make hard games. Right. Because you would have to find a whole bunch of really good developers who also happen to be really good at that one specific game. Uh huh. And like you would just lose out on a lot of uh, uh, you know people who could play. Like uh, like I know art always gets a lot of crap for for uh, not being great at the games, uh -huh. but like. Uh, I know plenty of That's designers not their job, and programmers. Right? That's the thing. It, yeah. it, it's not Art's job to be fucking 360 no-scoping people. <laughs> like, it's not really even design's job or programming's job either, right? right? Uh, you want to have some people who can do that because you want the, the that group represented in the design team somehow. But like, you're not going to get everybody being equally good at the game just because they worked on it. Right. And... That's what you want, because if you want to design a game with mass appeal, you're not going after the narrow subset. I think this is something we talked about well, in an older episode. You're not not going after them. Well, you don't. You're not going exclusively after that subset, right? Right. Yeah. And if you if you fill the if you fill the studio with just one type of people, your games are going to skew to a very specific subset of of players. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Which is the same thing with like wanting to get more more diverse. Uh, groups of developers, right? Is you can make more different things when you have people on your games who are not all the same. Right. And I think it's something we talked about before uh, in one of the older episodes, whereas you have to reach this point as a game developer where you stop designing... They want you to go across the, the gap where the crystal is. This one? Yeah. I think they want you there. Oh, yeah, the window's open. I thought the, I thought the window was solid. I had the same thing when I came here, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's the part where you, as you get going in game development, where you learn to stop designing for yourself and start yeah. designing for other people. And it's a skill that you have to learn. And if you haven't done game development, I can understand how you don't quite get that concept and you don't quite understand how you develop that skill. But it is an important skill. And just because you're not good at video games, just because you can't, like, you know, pull off the most intricate moves, doesn't mean you're not capable of designing with that in mind. Right. right. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, crash. Oh, oh cool. What the heck? That's crazy. Oh. They, so there's a, there's a, what's it called? A, a decal when you hit the screen and then they spawn particles, glass particles to come off of it. It's sort of like when you shoot the wall, right? It puts a little paint splotch on it. That's a cool idea. Uh, I'm supposed to be doing something here, I imagine. Oh, yeah. Hit the hit the crystal. I just hit the crystal. Come here. Uh, you, you, there was a robot. Oh, this guy. Oh. Yeah. Is it? You found a robot, and I think he was supposed to help with something. But I don't know where he went. Should have been paying attention. Yeah, we've been just sitting here chatting away. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, like, uh, this was this sort of driven home to me recently when I worked on Crash Bandicoot 4 is, like, I am not a great platformer player. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm fine. Right, and and yet, the uh, the people you're aiming Crash Bandicoot at generally are people who are very good platforming players because that's sort of like uh, that was always Crash's thing, right? It's the Crash was the 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 platformer for for grownups who wanted to play a real platformer, right? Right. Uh, and uh, and so we had to figure out how to design something that would be Dark Souls hard as a platformer and yet uh, uh, not be, in a lot of cases, capable of even beating the levels. Right. Uh, so it's like, uh, you know, we had, to, we had to come up with ways of figuring out how to make things hard that uh, didn't necessarily uh, uh, crowd out other people's ability to play it and it was stuff like uh you know we would we would come up with uh an obstacle show it to you show you a different obstacle and then overlap the two you know and that would make it way harder but it made it harder in a way that was like uh you could sort of reason your way through 
rather than being kind of more random or uh, or picky. Right. Uh, and it's just you know you you have to think you have to think uh, in a way that that enables those players to get the hard gameplay they want and doesn't necessarily you know, turn everyone off to the idea. Right. And in Ratchet, they do that with the difficulty tuning. Uh, but, you know, every game's a little bit different in that regard. Are you always suspicious that anyone you meet works for Emperor Nefarious? I think I probably needed to say 10 of, the, 10 of those sentences and then said 50. <laughs> I, I just think it was funny that, uh, you know, we, we, we give you shit for not being good at games, but this is not like... It's, it's a joke. Like, there's no... Like it has nothing to do with anything. Your ability as a designer, your ability as your ability as a game developer is not impacted by your ability to play a game. And if you think it's an anomaly that people who play games are not particularly skilled at them, uh, you're in for a wake-up call. And there's some who are. Yeah, there's some who are for sure. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I was better at games uh, before I got really old uh, because there there's. There's something there that's just harder to do, you know? I mean, like, there's also just, like... And the other thing is, like, with rare exception, no developer is ever going to be as good as the best players of the game just because they don't play it as much. Like, so much of skill in games comes from, like, practice. muscle memory and practice and all that kind of thing. Um, and a lot of developers just don't have the time to put in the kind of time you need to put into the game that players... The players do, right? Yeah, I mean, maybe, and you know, it might just be like lots of players. Maybe you have a family that you need to take care of, right? Or, you know, uh, uh, like there's lots of mitigating circumstances that mean you can't practice a ton, right? Uh, and I know for a fact I didn't play as much of any game I've ever worked on than most of the players, you know. Because it's you know you're mostly in your level, or your parts of the game, like working and tuning them, and really the only game the game is only fully assembled for what a few months before it ships, right? Usually, so you can't play the whole game even if you wanted to, right? Like except for going into each level separately, and then those levels aren't necessarily going to be tuned like they are in the final game because. Uh, you haven't lined them all up one next to the other to see how hard they are relative to each other. And mm -hmm. Like a lot of that stuff happens once you have big sections of the game completed. So even then you just don't have a lot of time to practice and play. Oh, looks like that combat section coming up. Plus, you know, I, I don't know that there's a lot of times and sometimes this is the case, but I don't usually play a lot of my games after they come out. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you go from you know, your, it being your every waking moment job. Yeah. Yeah. To you know, not having to worry about it anymore. It's it's hard to fight that desire to not have to think about this game for a little while, uh, right after release. Yeah. Look at that dodging. Uh, this is this looks pretty skillful, I think. Even though a lot of this is just kind of accidental. <laughs> you gotta take credit for it. Don't worry though, it doesn't look that skillful. So why is he all covered in the Decals. Is that something? That I think I hit him with some with uh, with a weapon or something. I don't know. I was it's to the point we were making before. It's it is difficult to play the game and put full attention and talk at the same time. Yeah, it's uh, I'm I'm definitely glad to be watching a little bit because it gives me a chance to to formulate what I want to say. And uh, whereas when I'm playing, it's really not possible to do that. Uh, like, I had to lean a lot on you talking while I was playing. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot. The reticle rain, I appreciate. Uh, 
There's few things more ratchet than some reticle wing. <laughs> I don't know what gun to use right now. Like that's, I'm paralyzed by choice as to what what the, gun I want to be using. The, the drill, drill hand is kind of like good, a right? rocket launcher. Yeah. It took me a while to realize uh, that that shadow jump, you're you're immune in the middle of it. Yeah, like that's so powerful. Yeah, I just need some life. I'm low on, I'm low on life here. Oh, I died. Oh. <clears throat> I spent too much time looking for life and not fighting. I probably should have just been fighting. I would talk some shit about this, except that by this time I'd already lowered the difficulty. <laughs> uh, so I, I got no legs to stand on. The other thing is, I'm in my 100% playthrough that I've been doing. Oh, those crabs. Yeah, those are the crabs. Oh, okay, sorry. In the, when the 100% playthrough that I was doing on... Oh, I see. I hit him with the shatter gun and that put the decal on him. Oh, interesting. I don't think I had that upgrade for the shatter gun. Uh, in the, yeah, in the one that I'm doing that has, like, the... That I'm doing, like, all the stuff so I can give good commentary on, all, on like, actually all the, date, the data, my weapons are much more upgraded. Uh, like, we didn't do any up weapon upgrading on, on this one. Uh, oh, so you've got better. Yeah, like in in that other playthrough, I, like the Nevatron Collider is already like fully maxed out. The the uh, the pistols already maxed out. So like, yeah, my weapons are not uh, probably at the, oh, uh, the greatest stage. I see. So what we're playing now probably has worse weapons than what we were playing in the previous episode. Yeah, I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, that that would make sense. Because you were trying to rush to get here. Yeah. Oh, so many guys. Oh, full shotgun. Oh, he's almost dead. I should just kill him. Eight percent. percent done ship it I mean why bother trying to find life and just kill the guy yeah best defense is a good offense right okay minor setback uh, gonna take a little longer to decode this message but you guys can use the drill uh, Jim will take you there so we're coming up on an hour here so this might be a good place to break the episode uh, sure. Or is this the end of the mission, or is there still a lot more after this, uh, after this part of the mission? I don't remember. I mean, we could, it, do, it looks like you filled in most of the maps. Yeah, I think this is, I think we're at the start. end of the mission here. So let's just finish off this mission. Hello, are you my new best friend? Uh, sure. This reminds me of the Stephen Merchant bot. Yes. In the name Portal. Right, too. That can't be good. That dimensional anomaly is identical to the one we saw on Sargasso. Good. That means you can deal with it. Oh, no, we're not. Uh... Oh, yeah, it looks like we're going to go into a plank section. But that looks like a good stopping point in general. We're done with that mission, so I think yeah. we're back at the hub. Cool. So for definitely not developer commentary, uh, my name is Mike Stout. I'm Tony Garcia. And we'll catch you next time.